you know, the, the, the question of climate change, or the topic of climate change and public health is, uh, public health impacts is huge. Um, so I thought that since you've probably heard about a number of public health impacts, I would focus mostly on water quality related issues and just give four um, examples of things that we're thinking about. And um, as was mentioned, I'm an environmental engineer. I do a lot of work in water treatment, wastewater treatment. Um, and water quality. And so there are a number of climate change impacts that we're thinking about as a field because it really impacts the quality of water that we're <coughs> receiving. Um, so as was mentioned, there's a ton of issues that, that, you know, public health issues that arise with climate change. And that's because climate change impacts the environment and there are very, very um, uh, direct impacts to the environment on public health. We can't forget that. So anytime you think about environmental quality, you have to think about public health. Um, we talked about disease vectors. Um, extreme heat and cold, droughts and floods have um, really important impacts. Um, air quality, but again, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about water quality today. Um, to start with flood water. So with climate change, we're expecting there to be more extreme rain events, um, more flooding because of these rain events, but also for, for uh, le uh, sea level rise issues. Um, and one thing that I always like to point out to my students is anytime you think about flood water, you have to think about environmental con contaminants. Flood water is always con uh, contaminated if you're in agricultural areas or in urban areas. And so these are photos from um, Houston after Hurricane Harvey, and you can see some obvious contamination, you know, signs of contamination in these waters. Um, concerns with flood waters is that we often have you know, sewage contamination of those floodwaters. You're either overloading your sewage treatment plants or people have on-site treatment systems like septic tanks or pit latrines and that if you're flooding, you're flooding out those systems. Um, we also have combined sewer systems uh, in a lot of cities. So anytime you think about floodwater, you should think about sewage. There's definitely sewage in there. Um, there's issues of oil from, from cars that get flooded, et cetera. Gas stations are a major issue. Um, but it, we also have to think about toxic chemicals. So toxic chemicals could be those that come from industrial sites. They could be contaminated sites. Um, there were concerns in Puerto Rico after Maria about all the Superfund sites that there are around Puerto Rico and that those are flooded. Similar issue with the Gowanus community here in Brooklyn and the Gowanus Canal, which is one of our biggest Superfund sites. If that canal overflows, it is gonna be overflowing toxins all over the neighborhood. Um, and then household chemicals. We all keep chemicals at our homes, pesticides, um, solvents, et cetera, and they're often in our basements and garages. So whenever you have major flooding events, you have to think about those, um, those chemicals. Additionally, in agricultural areas, there are different additional concerns about pesticides, herbicides, and animal waste. Um, North Carolina is the biggest producer of poultry in the United States, or one of the biggest producers of poultry. All of that poultry waste is stored in giant open lagoons and it's not treated. And so Hurricane Matthew a number of years ago, and I think there was another hurricane more recently, when it flooded those farms, all that animal waste got mobilized and went into waterways around, um, uh, in the communities around. Um, another thing to think about when flood, with flooding is that when those floodwaters recede, a lot of those chemicals are then deposited on surfaces. Um, and so you still have a potential exposure route after flood, flood water is gone, and then mold comes in. And so especially in hot places, when you have damp building materials, molds are a major inhalation hazard, a public health hazard as well. Um, as environmental engineers, we are really concerned about algae blooms. Um, as environmentalists in general, we should be concerned about algae blooms, but harmful algae blooms are particularly concerning when we think about drinking water supplies. Um, so climate change is expected to increase the rate and number of algae blooms for a number of reasons. First of all, with stronger storms, as I mentioned, we have more runoff of nutrients that can feed algae and result in those blooms. Um, algae really like warm water as well. So as we have warming surface water bodies, we have more algae blooms. Um, and then there's this other question, um, which is still hypothesized, not proven yet, but algae is a plant and plants use CO2 to respire. And so if we're increasing the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, are we also kind of enhancing the rate of growth of algae? Um, and if you know a lot of greenhouses around the world actually pump CO2 into them to increase productivity, you can think of a similar thing in the oceans and waterways. Um, so we're experiencing more algae blooms. This is work from Chris uh, Gobler, who looked at algae blooms um, in the North Atlantic, and they found that both the season of algae, the number of days when algae blooms occurred, and also the rate of growth increased. 
um, uh, over the years, which they have you know, attributed with climate change. The concern with how, at harmful algae blooms in particular is that these are toxin-producing algae. So generally, we're concerned with any algae bloom about eutrophication and creating an anaerobic zones in, uh, in, in environmental waterways, which is an issue for ecosystems. Um, but with ha harmful algae blooms and toxins that are produced, these are toxins that can be dangerous to wildlife, but they can also be dangerous to people. Um, so there's a, a number of different toxins, too, that are often cited are microcystin, which can lead to skin irritations, allergic reactions, um, GI illness, but also has issue, uh, potential um, damage to, to, or potential liver toxicity. Um, saxitoxin is a neurotoxin. Um, it's the main cause of paralytic shellfish, shellfish poisoning, um, which occurs because shellfish are filter feeders, and so they actually will um, concentrate uh, the toxin. And if someone eats it, um, it, it and it's high enough concentration, it can be very harmful. Um, so we are concerned about dermal exposure, inhalation hazards, um, and ingestion and bathing and, and, and fishing, it, ingestion of fish and shellfish. But a, a big concern for us in the water community is what happens, because a lot of these water bodies are, are sources of drinking water. So if we have a major source of drinking water, that it's a huge harmful algae bloom. And you can imagine the higher concentration of algae have, the higher concentration of toxins. Are we able to remove those toxins before we send water out to people in their homes? And there's a huge line of research into this right now. And the EPA is, you know, the EPA doesn't fund many things right now, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Um, but harmful algae blooms is one of the things they continue to fund research on because they're very, very concerned. Also related to algae, um, well, I say in general, um, water-related pathogens is something that I, I, I study um, quite a bit. And there is definite concern that climate change is going to result in an increase in the um, uh, prevalence of, of water-related disease due to pathogens. Um, I'm going to give first an example of cholera. Um, this is data, it's kind of old now, it's from 1996 from Rita Caldwell. Um, and what her group has found is that there is a correlation between sea surface temperature and uh, cholera cases. Um, and what they, and there's, there's a number of confounding factors that had to be worked out since this was published. Um, but generally what happens with cholera is a specific example. Cholera likes to associate with zooplankton. And zooplankton are these tiny little primary producers that are in, in all water bodies. Um, but cholera attaches to them. And cholera can be in, um, can attach to these primary producers up to like a thousand cells per organism. The infectious dose of cholera is about 10,000. And so if you think about ingesting water, if you need to ingest 10,000 cells, you can ingest just 10 of these zooplankton and get that dose. And so they kind of, in a way, concentrate the bacteria um, uh, so that it, it's, it's this kind of exaggerated route of exposure. So what we found is that um, increased, so the, the metric here is increased sea surface, sea surface temperature, which is in that dotted line. Um, what really is the case is that algae blooms, again, when you have an algae bloom, zooplankton like to eat algae. And so if you have an algae bloom, you have a zooplankton bloom, and then you then have these increase in cases of cholera. Um, there's concerns about other water-related pathogens that do really well and like to grow in warmer water. So Legionella pneumophila, which causes Legionnaire's disease. Um, Neglaria fowleri, which is also called the brain-eating amoeba, which is kind of a very scary organism. Um, we've seen increased cases of both of these organisms, and the CDC is very, very concerned about them. Um, wh whether that's because we have more reporting that's still to be worked out, but it's, it's enough of a concern that there's more research going in to try to understand what the... the um, uh, you know, how climate change in warmer waters is enhancing these uh, two illnesses. Okay, the last case that I want to talk about is, is dissolved organic carbon. And uh, so dissolved organic carbon is a proxy for what we call dissolved organic matter. It's just like organic matter that's all, that's like degraded in, in all surface water. So if you think about broken down leaf litter, or anytime you like look at a natural water and it has like a brown or an orange tint or kind of a greenish tint, that's organic matter. It's natural, it's in every water body. Um, we know we've learned a lot over the years about the chemistry of this organic matter and how it influences drinking water treatment. Um, but what we're finding is that with increased climate change, there's a projection that we're gonna have more DOC in surface waters because there's more runoff, and we might have different types of dissolved organic carbon, like the chemical compounds may be different. Um, and that's because we have different uh, additions. So one example is forest fires. 
We have an increase in wildfires. The ash from wildfires is organic matter. Um, and if it deposits into surface water bodies, that can change the water chemistry. And if it changes the water chemistry, it can then change the chemistry that happens in a drinking water treatment plant. Um, so we're still trying to figure out how to, how to manage that as a field. So, right, runoff and deposition of forest fires. It can impact surface water chemistry. Um, these surface waters are used often for drinking water. Um, and so one major concern is um, disinfection byproducts. So this compound up here is just like a model NOM or DOC compound. It's these, these organic, these compounds tend to be very complex. They're very variable. Um, we chlorinate in drinking water treatment systems to disinfect. One of the challenges is that chlorine reacts with organic matter to form disinfection byproducts, tri trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids. And these are known carcinogens. Um, and so we do whatever we can in drinking water treatment plants to try to reduce the formation of these compounds. But given that we're having a shift and potentially higher concentration as a field, we're still trying to understand what that means in terms of the water we're providing to people. Um, this is, you know, what I had just a couple brief examples. I'm happy to take more questions later. I wanted to take one quick tangent also. Um, I was thinking last night when I was sitting at home about what my main concerns are. And the major concerns are about climate change and public health. Um, and I realized that one of the biggest concerns I personally have is, is the increase in conflict and violence that comes, and conflict and violence are major public health concerns. Um, there's a really nice review paper, um, and I, again, this, I came up with this last night, so I don't have the slide to show you, um, but it's by um, Solomon Singh and Tamara Carlton at UC Berkeley. They, made it, they had a really nice review paper where they showed um, correlations between climate um, and, and not just climate change necessarily, but climate and social and economic outcomes. And one thing that they showed is that with increases in temperatures, there's also increases in aggression, and they show it in interesting ways in showing homicides, rape, online social media aggression, like in, a, in a various different ways. It's not proven, but it's there. But there's also these secondary concerns because climate change is going to lead to a lot of challenges in terms of food security and water security and displacement. Um, and so these secondary um, effects also could have a major um, uh, impact on things like conflict. So anyway, with that tangent, I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker and I look forward to your questions.